Retina Rounds, episode number 116. Surgical Planes and Diabetic Tractional Retinal Detachment Repair. In today's episode, we'll focus on finding the right surgical plane right at the vitreoretinal retinal interface to tackle diabetic TRDs. Now, this not only makes a surgical repair safer, decreasing the risk of iatrogenic breaks, but it also makes a surgery more efficient. Our returning guest surgeon is Dr. Jesus Maticorena from Peru, and we want to thank him for sharing this case. So the patient is a monocular diabetic with long-standing tractional retinal detachment involving the macula. You can see from the pre-op fundus photo that there's a large, broad area of fibrosis over the macula causing a tabletop tractional retinal detachment. Vitreous hemorrhage is present and the patient has not been previously treated with PRP. Here, wide field fundus photography can be helpful not only to document the degree of pathology, but also for mapping a surgical strategy. The key is to access the correct surgical plane, which is between the posterior cortical vitreous and the retinal surface. Remember that diabetic vitreous can be highly skittic, like layers of an onion. Iatrogenic retinal breaks typically occur when the surgeon thinks they're beneath the cortical vitreous when, in fact, there's still a layer of cortical vitreous attached to the retina. The subhyloid hemorrhage in this case supratemporally may be an area where the hyloid is partially separated from the underlying retina and may be a good access point for a dissection. Now, when the view permits, preoperative OCT can also be helpful to identify areas where a partial PVD is present. In the upper horizontal scan through the macula, we can see a broad area of vitreoretinal adhesion that's detaching the macula. However, the arrow points out a separation between the hyloid and the underlying retina, which is the correct plane for dissection. The bottom vertical scan also shows a similar finding in the inferior macula, which again is the correct surgical plane for dissection. So let's see how this case goes. All right, this is a 23 gauge vitrectomy and Dr. Matikrena starts with a core vitrectomy and now he's segmenting the anterior and posterior cortical vitreous. So you can see that there's a partial PVD present temporally and now that's being extended out inferiorly. Now you remember from the OCT that that inferior area looked to be the correct surgical plane, but it looks to be a quite adherent to the underlying retina. And so now Dr. Matikrena has gone now in that supratemporal area where that subhyloid hemorrhage appears to be and he's trying to dissect into this area using, uh, using horizontal scissors. Now that he's found the correct surgical plane, again, between the posterior cortical vitreous, between this fibrosis and the underlying retina, he's using the vitreous cutter to carefully dissect, going through these areas of fibrosis with the cutter. Now you'll remember from prior episodes that you can generally be confident in cutting through these membranes if you can see that translucent or thin fibrotic tissue through the mouth of the cutter. Now it can be a little bit dangerous using the cutter through these very tightly adherent areas over the macula, uh, but using the cutter that can be gently elevated, using the cutter almost like a hook. Now Dr. Matikarina has segmented that, you know, that nasal and temporal areas of fibrosis. There's still some fibrotic tissue over the optic nerve and now he's tackling this more supranasal quadrant. Again, using the cutter to use it as a hook to gently elevate up a, a plane uh, and to try to advance the cutter. Now, going back to the forceps, he's uh, elevating this membrane over the optic nerve and now you can see that that area, uh, again, that area that we had identified previously on the OCT as a correct surgical plane, he's elevating up uh, that fibrosis and we don't see any, uh, any vitreous that's adherent inferiorly, but on the nasal side, you can see that there's still some vitreous that's stuck to the underlying retina and using the forceps, he's gently elevating up uh, that, that vitreous to elevate up uh, that, the correct surgical plane uh, between uh, the vitreous uh, and the underlying um, and the underlying retina. So now uh, trimming back uh, some of these adhesions and segmenting uh, some of these fibrovascular pegs. Now you'll notice that there's quite a bit of, of bleeding that's going on here and that's important to try to address. Diabetic blood can be very rich in fibrin and can therefore be very highly adherent to the underlying retina. So um, that can, if it's left behind, it can actually create another surgical challenge of trying to elevate uh, the hemorrhage off of the retinal surface. Now, uh, again, going back to the vitreous cutter here, uh, Dr. Matikrena is delaminating some of these segmented fibrovascular pegs and then again using that cutter as a hook to try to elevate up the areas of the vitreous that are still adherent uh, to the peripheral retina. And by doing that, he can actually come around these residual areas of fibrosis. You can see, again, going back to the, uh, the forceps, elevating up, uh, trying to pull up on this membrane uh, on the posterior side, which is where the vitreous has already been segmented. Not able to do that, but then going back to the cutter and then elevating up the vitreous that's anterior to this area of fibrosis, 
going around 360 is going to allow him to um, safely delaminate that area. All right, now going back to a temporal area of fibrosis, there are some areas here that appear to be pretty adherent. The retina looks to be pretty detached. And, you know, when, this, when there's this amount of subretinal fluid, uh, one can be uh, a little bit concerned about the presence of a small micro break. Again, important to clear off the hemorrhage just to make sure that there's not any small breaks that are contributing to a potentially combined tractional and regmatogenous retinal detachment. Now, it's certainly okay to leave uh, some of the fibrotic areas uh, segmented. Um, bimanual dissection can also be used uh, in areas uh, where the retina is detached. Now, this is an important step. Dr. Monte Crane is performing 360-degree uh, panretinal photocoagulation. Important here to try to get as much anterior PRP in as possible. Don't laser into areas of detached retina. That can always be added in later on in the clinical setting. Uh, air fluid exchange is done, and that concludes the case. So the key take-home point in this episode is to find the plane between the posterior cortical vitreous and the underlying retina, which is shown by the red arrow in the image to the right. Now this was first described by our very own Dr. Steven Schwartz in his seminal publication from 1996. And this is a must-read paper for anyone who wants to learn how to properly manage TRDs. So the first step is to identify the posterior cortical vitreous and access this space just posterior to it. Again, remember diabetic vitreous can be highly skittic, so don't be fooled by an additional layer of vitreous that may still be attached to the underlying retina. Preoperative OCT imaging, as demonstrated in this case, can be helpful to see where a partial PVD is present. And if you're unsure, intraoperative use of triamcinolone can also be used to confirm areas where the posterior hyaloid is up. Now, to access the space between the posterior hyaloid and the retina, a hyaloidotomy can be created with the vitreous cutter, and my preference is to cut the vitreous in a circumferential fashion to further expose the correct space and surgical plane. Now, performing this type of segmentation of the posterior and anterior cortical vitreous may not only help to propagate the PVD in areas where the hyaloid is still attached to the underlying retina, but it can also help to prevent anterior vitreoretinal traction when peeling or manipulating posterior areas of preretinal fibrosis. Now, once the space has been accessed, then the dissection can occur using either the cutter, scissors, or a pick to cleave the plane and sharply dissect the preretinal fibrosis from the underlying retina. Working in this space will significantly decrease the chance of an iatrogenic retinal break, but slow, careful dissection is still necessary for the best surgical results. Now, the degree of segmentation versus delamination is going to be up to the surgeon's discretion. While I prefer to remove as much preretinal fibrosis as possible, this has to be weighed against the risk of creating an iatrogenic retinal break. Now, don't forget that the primary surgical goal here is to relieve traction involving the macula. Both during and once the dissection is completed, remember also to address any oozing vessels with diathermy or laser. PRP should be done anterior to the equator and up to the aura, avoiding laser to areas where the retina is detached. Assuming no retinal breaks are present, any residual fluid will slowly resolve over time, and this can take months due to the thick nature of the subretinal fluid. Posterior fill-in PRP, if needed, can usually be applied in the clinic easily uh, for both the patient and the surgeon. For cases where the underlying retina is detached, bimanual dissection can be helpful due to the lack of underlying retinal countertraction. Now, in this case, Dr. Mati Carino was able to perform the dissection with one hand using the vitreous cutter, scissors, and forceps. And he was able to avoid creating any iatrogenic retinal breaks, not only due to his surgical skill, but also by keeping his instruments in the correct surgical plane. Thanks again, Dr. Mati Carino, for showing us this key surgical principle and for sharing this case. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.